So these are two of the big noteworthy changes in the program, but these are not the only changes that happened in the RIA. Are there any other items that you guys would like to highlight as monumental changes from the old EB-5 to the new? They made it a hell of a lot more expensive, right? <laughs> so part of it is like, look, there. on one hand, what I've told people is that the program has gotten more expensive, yes. Right, so let's look at, like anything else in life, I understand that if you're gonna buy something and the price has gotten more expensive, what are you getting in return? So concurrent filing, good. You know, some visa set aside, sure. The other thing I think is important to note is that, uh, and, and we've discussed this before, is it brought a slew of essentially compliance changes to the program, a lot more disclosure, you're required to give, you know, project updates to investors, audits and everything else. The funny thing is, uh, what that really does is create like a universal standard that some of the high functioning regional centers have already done, right? Transparency and everything else. What's, what's surprising is a lot of investors don't realize that that is something that was even possible, right? Like they operate out this, this thing of like, I hope I get updates. I hope like the, the audit, the financials and everything else. Meanwhile, like the, the ones that have been institutional that have been around for a while have been doing this already. So I think that's a, from a, a compliance and, and certainly like an investor safety standpoint, that's important because it weeds out the people who are just chasing fast money, which is not fast as, as we all know, right? Yeah, now. right. So yeah, I think when investors ask us, they're like, you know, what should we be asking the project? Yeah, I'm like, ask them how they operate. What safeguards do they have? What are their compliance procedures? What operations do they have that oversee all these various entities that oversee the flow of the funds? How are they going to create your jobs? I think that's, that's really, really important for an investor. Which brings up a relevant topic. Civitas is a registered investment advisor, which is not something that is very common in the EB-5 industry, at least up to this point. So it's, they're going to, because it's, it's like you're saying, it's uncommon, right? So a common question is going to be, so what's a registered investment advisor? Why have, haven't I seen an EB-5 and why does it benefit me? Yeah, exactly. Well, I have to be careful here because the regulations governing the, uh, under the Advisors Act make it very clear that the fact that we are registered in and of itself is not an endorsement by the federal government, okay? That's not what it means. What it means is that we manage a certain minimum amount of capital that has reached a threshold where we're required to register with the Securities and Exchange Commission um, and that when that requirement kicks in, we're subject to a whole um, long list of requirements under the Advisors Act. So one of those um, is uh, there's a, a, a fairly significant um, transparency to our business. Anyone can go online at any time and pull our form ADV, it's called, um, from the SEC website and see everything that we manage at any, one, at any given time. It can also see how our company is structured and who the key executives are. Not what the website says, but what we have said under penalty of perjury <laughs> to, to the federal government. Um, that's an example of the kind of requirements that are imposed upon us. One of the other requirements that is new, as you've mentioned, um, under the Integrity Act, um, but that we have had to comply with for some time is audits, for example. Audits, we, have to, we audit every single investment entity that we manage, which is over 60 at this point. Um, that's not cheap. You know, that requires resources, requires you know, expertise and a team um, to get that done on time and accurately every year. That's something that, you know, as a firm, has been part of our standard operating procedure for many years now. But in the EB-5 space, that's new, you know. And most, even in, even under the Integrity Act, most um, regional centers will opt, rather than auditing their financials every year, they will opt to have a third-party administrator, which is a an alternative, or the primary alternative for most, I think. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. We have that too. We, we also have third-party administrators for our for our funds, so we do both. Is it fair to say that under, as an RIA, that your compliance, your reporting, your auditing requirements are higher than what's actually in the RIA for EB-5? As a general matter, I would say that's correct, yes. 
I bring it up because when the integrity measures, when the, the RA first came out, there's a lot of talk about how compliance and how uh, putting in these, these procedures and everything else would be financially crippling mm -hmm. for a number of regional centers. And my response to that was like, if you don't have the money to, to hire staff to do, third, to do accounting, to do these reports and everything else, I would frankly be terrified of you managing my money through a five, seven, 10 year cycle. Right? Those are one of the easiest ways that you can kind of like really pull back, I think, the, the hype, the sexy, the sexy outside of it and like really get into nitty gritty of in five, seven, 10 years, are they still gonna be around? Yeah, yeah and, and you know, for us, I'm used to having underwriters and you know, due diligence professionals and third party you know, auditors come in and ask for whatever they want to see. And if we like, we have to provide it and if they're not satisfied, we, that's it. We don't get their money. Not just in, in, you know, individual EB-5 investors. You know, this is, it, it's the same people, it's the same procedures, it's the same investment committee that, um, we, you know, that we use to manage our entire assets that we manage. You know, I actually think that's a really good point because you know, another question investors ask us, they're like, okay, how do I know that this is the right project? I always say, well, make sure it's not their first rodeo. Make sure that if you're picking a project, they've done this before. They've developed a, a highly successful project. They've gotten conditional green cards, permanent green cards. They've created the jobs. They've started to repay uh, investors. And the same thing goes for their attorneys too. Make sure this isn't their first filing. Yeah. Yeah. Make sure that they've actually yeah. filed I-526s before, 829s before, and, and green card application. Because again, that's your immigration risk and that's your financial risk. I, I agree. And it's funny because we get a lot of questions as you can imagine about what's your track record? What's your background? Yeah. Uh, can you help us due diligence? All, all fine questions to ask. We understand what they're really asking, right? And it's like, so we, so from time to time, we did this more at the beginning. Yeah, you want us to do a due diligence report with all these different factors and everything else, we can do it and we've done it. But what, what I, what we discover when we talk to people is they don't always understand it still, right? It's broken down, but it almost has to be more straightforward than that. So if Neural brings up some very good points, which is there are a couple of like just key questions any investor, any agent can ask the person they're working with and get really, you can really get a feel for how they are, right? For law firms, you might be around for 25, 30, 35 years and do, doing EB-5, but maybe you've done 100. Chances are you're not going to find someone that's done 5,000, right? That understands country-specific issues, that has seen how UCS has evolved their adjudications throughout the years, what sort of what sort of like terms, investment terms, conditions they're okay with. When you see it over and over again, you get a real feel for how the agency will will regulate things, right? Uh, what we say with regional centers is that if you're picking a regional center, and you know we go back and forth about this, but I think an easy thing to think about and what's, what's really not understood is you want a regional center, a group that's been through multiple life cycles, multiple life cycles, right? Um, a lot of, uh, one way, easy way to ask is, you know, have they repaid money? There are industry groups out there that give awards for 829 approval. Nice, but I think that's the bare minimum. Like you should be doing that. Right. It's very telling that there aren't very many awards for repayment of investor money, right? Okay because the reality is there's probably gonna be a handful, right? Um, that's an easy way of, of figuring out like how, just how successful they've been. But I think more to the point is this, um, anyone who's worked on, who, who's, who's tried to start a business, who's tried to like build a project or any sort of real estate development knows that life cycle is hard, knows that there's all sorts of things that can go wrong when you go through these things, right? So someone that's been through like multiple offerings, multiple project cycles is, I think I will put a premium on that, right? That's been through recessions, that have been through pandemics, right? Who have not laid off their staff and everything else. Um, I think that's, that's gonna be very difficult to find in a mark of a well-run company.